everybody. My name is Meng Meng, and uh, I work for a company called C Studio. So for those of you guys who kind of plays around uh, hardware a little bit, you probably have heard of us or bought stuff from our website. Um, our company is based in Shenzhen, the manufacturing capital in China, which is the manufacturing center of the world, I guess. Um, so <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about manufacturing, which I think is a topic that has been kind of neglected um, as this IoT thing is becoming really popular. Um, a bit more about me, I started my career as a management consultant, um, flying around places, giving people PowerPoint presentation and not do anything about them. Uh, <laughs> but then I, I started doing business research after that and I really dived into manufacturing and how this whole dynamic is changing for, um, from consumer demands to uh, tools that are available to people. So I um, wrote a paper on future manufacturing if you want to Google it, it's a huge, super, super long paper. Um, search my name, Future Manufacturing, and then Deloitte, uh, which is a company that I was working for. Um, you'll see it. Um, but then really throughout this process, um, got to know the manufacturing in China and how everything is evolving significantly, much less, um, um, very different from things that I was used to, and many people have this image of about Chinese manufacturing. So um, I got to know this company called Seed, and I decided, oh, they're actually realizing the vision that I was writing about in my paper. So I want to join a company to actually make it happen. So I joined the company, and then helped them start a US office, and then here I am um, kind of getting my hands dirty and feeling a lot of the pain points um, um, that I didn't really know about when I was mostly doing PowerPoints and talking about theories. Um, so to start with, I guess I want to talk a little bit about future manufacturing and then some of the premise in the paper that I wrote. Um, essentially, um, as the entire IoT space is booming, um, part of it is becoming making hardware is becoming easier. And that partly is driven by this increasing like, fragmented consumer demand. So we see this in media, we see this in you know, uh, all kinds of industry where people are kind of looking for something that's customized for them. And how do we customize hardware for them? Um, and that's a big question. And there's also a big piece of people, people wanting to become more like creators. So you probably heard of the term maker movement. More people are doing their DIY stuff and getting their hands dirty with Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all the open source hardware platforms. And that is a big part of what's driving the change of what might change, uh, what, what's going to happen in the future for manufacturing. Um, and then the nature product is definitely different. Everything's becoming more connected. We're in, at an IoT conference, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, Economics of production, uh, the availability of 3D printers, and then um, everything is becoming so, so much easier to create nowadays. So that um, uh, the economics of making something has changed significantly, and the, the economy of scale has changed also. Um, and then the last part is value chain. Um, the fact that people can build their online presence and build their online media means that hardware doesn't have to start from a manufacturer and then go to a wholesaler and then go to the, re uh, go to the retail store and then, then finally to the customer. You have this chain of value chain that's kind of being disrupted and then that's what's shaping manufacturing to be a little bit different these days too. So under this whole big shift of um, so this is basically what I wrote about in that, my paper. And then I talked about this like really fancy ideas and how everything is so different. And I was really excited to join this company. It's like, yes, I'm going to make it happen. But then after I joined the company, I realized manufacturing is still really a big pain in the ass. Like, seriously, um, has anyone here been involved with the hardware development in the, this room? Raise your hand. Is it easy? Is it ever easy? No. I, I think... Anyone who has been through this process knows that it's such a big, big pain, and it's, it's never easy. So every time I'm at one of these conferences, there's always these talks like the one that I was talking about before. For people who hasn't been through a manufacturing process, they're saying, 
You know, hardware is like a new software. This is so sexy. We have all these like 3D printers that can do everything. It's really just like software, but it's really not. So <laughs> this is often after I kind of delved into this space, what I keep telling people that hardware is really hard. And it's um, one of the metaphors I like to use is like hardware is like an orchestra because you have to coordinate so many levels of physical existence from your suppliers to your, to, your, to your factory, to your design, to your engineers, to your distribution channel, and the cost associated is very high. So, and then I think that's something, as this whole IoT movement is bringing more people into this space, and likely more people who have not dealt with hardware at all, this is going to be one of their biggest um, learning curves um, that I have to face. And then every day as we're helping more startups kind of go through this process, this is exactly what we need to kind of educate people on. Um, so if you go look at um, Kickstarter campaigns, there's all of these people who kind of put up a really good idea, have a prototype, and then got a bunch of mo money, and then all of a sudden they got really popular and got funded, and they're like, Oh shit, now what I do. Um, <laughs> so so we, we see these people every day, and which is likely also why you see hardware projects on Kickstarter getting delayed, I think, 86% of the time, if not more than that, if not canceled at all altogether at all. The reason being there are so many potential ticking time bombs as you go through the manufacturing process, and these are simply things that people don't consider when they're first making the product. People think of manufacturing as this like giant black box that they don't even think about um, as they're designing the product. They, a lot of people, even like a lot of electrical engineers that we work directly with, they probably are very good at like design and PCB layout and whatever, but they've only designed things in a lab and mostly people that I talk to in the U.S. Are, are likely like that. They have never taken a product from a functional product to all the way to production. And that is the biggest problem because when you're taking something to manufacturing, there's so many other things that you're going to have to consider that will feed back to your product design. So oftentimes, um, when... Whenever I talk to like startup teams who haven't been through manufacturing, they're always like so eager. Like they give us the design file, they give us show us the prototype, and they're like, "So tell me, how long is it going to take, and how much is going to cost?" And that's like the only two questions that they care about. And it seems like it's something that they can just throw the files into, and then two months later, we're just going to give them like a finished product. But in those cases, we always tell them. No, it's more than that. These are things that you need to change. These are the components that, you know, it's going to hold up your, your scaling up. And it's, it's more than just cost and time. You have to, we have to kind of work through these process together. So I think that is one of the biggest things that um, people kind of don't realize and often neglect um, from time to time. So... Um, Seed as a, what we call ourselves, an open um, hardware innovation platform. So our mission is really to kind of help lower the barrier of hardware development in all of these steps, including kind of helping people to educate design from manufacturing. So we always talk about DFM, design for manufacturing. This is a term that's often used in manufacturing industry. As you give me an engineering sample, the in, the uh, the engineers on our team will kind of take a look at from a manufacturability perspective. And that's also called DFM, which is uh, short for design for, for manufacturing. But even that term, I think it's a little bit backwards. We really need to kind of understand the manufacturing and kind of have it feed back into the product design. And only in those cases, you will be able to shorten your lead time. You will be able to not having to sweat in a Chinese factory and talk to the workers for like three months and not having anything return. Right? So, so the, the, this term that design from manufacturing is really something that we, as we talk to our customers and users on a daily basis that we have to emphasize. And then it can be a harder concept to educate. So, um, 
I do hope that before you guys kind of delve into any hardware design, um, going through this, this, these points together today with you guys can kind of help you kind of be in a good mindset for those things. So um, if we talk about uh, hardware development process, these are some of the bigger steps that can be a pain um, for people. So from prototyping to designing, to all sourcing and supply chain from to small batch production to larger batch production. And on the left side are some of the ways that we kind of have experimented with, with, as, with our experiences working with um, hardware startups. Um, and I'll dive into one, each and one of them. Um, the first piece is open source hardware. Um, I think sometimes people always ask me, what do, you mean, what do you mean open source? How is it open source? Well, well, first of all, they mean that these development platforms are widely popular and used among a wide range of communities from people who are not thinking about taking their product to all the way to the consumer level to like hackers and tinkers that you can find in garages and maker spaces. But everybody use platforms like these, and that also means that you have this kind of accumulative knowledge of people using these platforms and knowing how, how, what to do with them. Each and one of these platforms have their pros and cons, and depending on what the products you're trying to develop, it may make sense to use one or another, and there's tons of discussions out there on where to start easy, the price points and everything. Um, and then, so that, that's a really good way to start because you can already leverage a lot of knowledge that's out there instead of starting from completely scratch, which is, you know, work that's meaningless, right? And then um, another, uh, to add on to that, only the main boards can't do really anything. You need inputs and outputs. You need, you know, sensor and actuator to, for your product to be able to do something, right? So um, I think one of the things that people probably know about Seed Studio most is from our, our sensors, which is you know, basically plug and play. You can kind of hack together a prototype within a matter of you know, 10 minutes because you don't need to like soldier anything. As you are going through that proof of concept, when you just want to demonstrate if my idea would work, why would you have to go through the process of completely redesigning a product from the very beginning when you can use all of these existing products out there to kind of prove your concept, right? So this is really um, the reason why we encourage um, open source hardware and why we kind of become a um, open source hardware platform in, in that way because we kind of really advocate people using these and start from these things um, from the very beginning because um, they're very easy. And then we also have a wiki page that would, for every sensor or every platform that you kind of want to use, there's a wiki page that kind of tells you some library code, GitHub, um, things that you can basically copy and kind of start experimenting. And there's also a lot of things that people have done with these platforms that can, you can use with inspiration. So this is a very easy way to start for anyone who hasn't experimented with hardware um, to kind of get their hands dirty in the first place. And the next step would be redesigning. So imagine now you have a proof of concept. You have these really clunky um, but functional prototype that does what you want to do. It might be a temperature sensor plus a screen, whatever. Um, but now you want to make it into your own product. And that will go through the process of redesigning. Typically, that means that you need to have a solid engine, e engineer on your team to be able to do that. Um, and then oftentimes, this e engineer need a lot of support from different angles because one person can't do an entire person's job, uh, entire team's job because you need layout, you need schematics, you need c components and everything that goes on it. Um, so that's why um, we started with a um, new concept called Hardware Development Kit. Similar to the SDK that we always talk about in software, uh, Hardware Development Kit kind of gives you an access starting with this um, popular open source platforms, you will be able to kind of follow what other people has done in terms of redesigning the circuit. So that kind of solves you short gap 
the designing phase of it. Um, and then the next step is sourcing and supply chain. Um, this is another problem that I think for anyone who hasn't been in Shenzhen, they would find very hard to understand sourcing and supply chain and how that might impact their product as it scales up. If you've ever been to Shenzhen, you've probably heard of this place called Huaqiang Bay, which is essentially for any e-engineer, it is um, just buildings and buildings and buildings that sells electronics parts. You will be able to find anything you need in the world within a matter of seconds. And if you, if you can't um, pinpoint what you want to make, you probably can't find a manufacturer that can help with what you are trying to do. However, all of these products, um, need, you, you don't really know um, whether they're commonly used among other people. You don't really know whether they're good in quality. You don't really know that once you include a certain component in that product design, is that gonna change your manufacturing process? Is that gonna boost up your labor costs significantly as you assembly the product, right? Are these things that you will ever think about when you're doing product design? Most likely not, but you know, if you're just designing your product in this like very isolated state, by the time you move into product design, you will, by the time you move it into manufacturing, you'll realize, oh shit, this is really expensive to make. Now what I do, right? So one of the things that we've done is kind of picked up like popular components that, are peop uh, that people have used among uh, their projects and kind of make sure that they're sufficient stock, make sure they're good in quality, and also open source these EDA formats that, are, that can easily be feedbacked into your product design process. So that's one of the ways to, that we can um, try to tackle that. And then using these uh, components means that you're sharing supply chain with so many other people who are doing likely similar things as you are doing, which means that you can get things in a cheaper, cheaper rate uh, in better quantity. And whenever you want to scale up your production, these components are not going to become your bottleneck um, for, your, for your large manufacturing production. Um, the next is a distributed portal for small batch man, uh, production. So this is what I'm actually doing in the US. We actually set up a mini manufacturing line in the States. And every time I talk to people, so, and they always ask me, so your Chinese manufacturer bringing manufacturing back to the US, that sounds very interesting. And they find this concept very odd because everything is moving the other way, right? Why would you bring manufacturing back to the US? Um, and then, th but we always tell people it's exactly because I'm designed from manufacturing, right? When you're making 10 of something, 50 of something, the cost is not your biggest issue. Time is your biggest issue. Right now, with all of the IoT um, hype that's going around, time to market, it's so significant. You want to make your product design as optimal as possible, as many iterations as possible, and be able to kind of push it to market as soon as possible and become the first hitter among everybody else. So that's why you need to work with people alongside with you who know about manufacturing and kind of help, can be there to kind of help you tweak your product. Instead of you know, sitting there, sending a sample to China, wait for three weeks, come back, doesn't work, change again, send it to China, come back, doesn't work again. You lose so much time, right? And then the simple, yes, making prototypes in China, in US is gonna be a little bit more expensive than China, but the time that you save on your product development phase is so crucial to your team and to the brand that you're trying to build that I think these kind of simple investments are very significant. So we are starting in Silicon Valley. We're working with um, pretty prominent incubators and startups um, that, who are pushing this boundary of um, hardware development into the next phase. And we're, we, can kinda, we can help them to do a prototype of a product within three days. That is a time that has never been achieved in 
any other competitor. And then the fact that they can actually just come to our factory and work with us is extremely helpful because sometimes just face to face interaction is just so much more so much more faster. Um, and the last step is larger scale manufacturing. And in this case, we're trying to push a concept called open and agile manufacturing. Um, agile meaning that um, part of our manufacturing line are optimized for small, small batch manufacturing, meaning anything less than 10,000 units. Because compared to larger manufacturing lines who are optimized for millions, and um, we can think about Foxconn for, as an example, those people, um, they're very good at doing large scale, but they don't really know about doing small batch. The reason being um, larger scale manufacturing, meaning that every one worker is just doing one thing. They're optimized to do that one silo task they're taught to do, which means that as you're working with someone like that, you need to give them a very solicited test plan. You need to give them a very, very detailed quality assurance steps for every single worker of what they need to do. Um, one of the terms that we also talk about in Shenzhen is that Foxconn is actually a company that's trained by Apple because Apple is very, very particular in every little detail of what they want to do that they will give them a long list for like live a, even like a small power cord that they're trying to produce. Um, so the, the Apple uh, charger that we've seen, we've actually been into the production line in Foxconn. Um, can you imagine there's like 56 steps for doing that little power cord? It's unimaginable, right? But that's, those are steps that's optimized for when you're making millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of something. But it's not optimized when you're trying to do a thousand of something, 10,000 of something. Because you need people who are able to kind of take it from the beginning to the end. And then even designing and setting up that kind of product line takes way, way too long time and also a lot of cost. So, um, so our manufacturing line for part of it is optimized to do small batch manufacturing, which means that you can incrementally step up your production process as you go up from your product design. Um, and then it's optimized to do quick change of CKUs because um, nowadays we're seeing more and more start startups kind of quickly iterating their products. They do a Kickstarter campaign, this is the first version, and the next version they only do 10,000 or something else, and then they move on to the next thing. Right. So um, we actually work with a lot of teams who are um, more prone to kind of doing those kind of work. Um, and then open manufacturing means sharing. Um, so for people who hasn't been through manufacturing process, it can only be done easier if we share more about the pain that we felt um, through manufacturing process. So um, that could be a form of a wiki page, and then we're starting to share some of the test plans that we've kind of worked with the team in the past. Um, so that's something that we definitely want to push more off as we're going through this process. Um, so yeah. Um, so <laughs> another thing that I, I was here at these kind of conferences, like how do we deal with those Chinese manufacturers? Like they use the term deal with, like we're some kind of weird creatures or something. But I think people just need to understand that it is a different country, it is a different culture, and then you speak a different language. There's bound to be communication problems. And then, yes, they're not set up to be um, perfectly prone to kind of understanding all of your needs and anticipating what you might, need, you might do. But, and that, that can really cause a lot of problem as you work with them. Um, but I, it's really not that crazy. So this is what I always advise startup teams to do. Um, email, Skype, or just fly to China. It's not that crazy. Um, so I, can, I want to give you an example of a team that we worked with in the past. Um, Within that one week when they're in China, when Shenzhen, they work with our team um, and did three separate production runs within that one week. 10 units, 100 units, and then 1,000 units. And that kind of helped them to catch all of the little things that you, there's no way that you can anticipate um, for setting up production process, setting up a manufacturing process. 
um, in these incremental steps. So you're not ending up, you know, investing a ton of money doing 50,000 of something and ended up only 60% yield. Um, they work alongside with us, um, drawing, drawing boards, seeing if the stretch of the wristbands works. Um, so a lot of things, it's just really hard to communicate over Skype or Google Hangout even, um, because with, in this case, they're trying to make a wearable wristband, and they want to have a um, kind of stretchy um, kind of wristband, but it's really hard to kind of underestimate what exactly the stretchiness that they're looking for. And then those are really things of the physical element that you can't really take away with software or virtual communication. Um, this is our production line in China. That's our uh, company. And then you can see people rocking the pink suit as they're kind of walking along the production line and filming what's happening on the, on the line. So, um, yeah, this is what the factory looks like. Um, so I guess to to kind of close that, um, I I want to say that uh, manufacturing is not this kind of black box you shouldn't consider. You should really kind of get to know about it. There are people there out there who are kind of be able to walk you alongside um, together through this process. Um, but it's never going to be easy, and we can't. I, I never go out and tell my clients that, yes, don't worry, we're going to solve everything for you. No, that it doesn't really work this way in, in, the, in this business. Um, so we would like to say is that join us to feel the joy and pain of manufacturing. It, it's very hard, but it can also be very fulfilling. So, um, yes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about exactly what we do. Um, so we, we try to facilitate a hardware ecosystem, which means that we want to take people from prototype to production and all, with, all the way to promotion. Um, so and on, on the prototype stage, we do a lot of um, open source hardware and then a lot of different sensors that help people kind of hack together their projects. And then produce, it's very easy to explain, manufacturing service, we can uh, do a lot of um, helping you to kind of take the product from prototype to scale. And then the last be promotion. Um, we host the Maker Fair in Shenzhen. We're very connected to the entire ecosystem um, around the world. And then we also, through our own products, have an e-commerce and, and a global distribution network. So in often case, we can actually help a team um, go all the way to their distribution and drop shipping networks. So, um, trying to become a um, hardware ecosystem um, in this space as people scale up. These are some of the big people that we work with. You can see it kind of ranges from traditional industry to open source people and to hardware people, uh, startup people, um, kind of um, all over the place. But I think it's, uh, Shenzhen is becoming a very interesting space and uh, people all want to kind of get to know what's happening out there. So we are helping more and more people to get to know about manufacturing and kind of um, making this seemingly traditional industry becoming sexy again. So yeah, that's my talk today. Thank you.